Yeah, I think uh, we can get started. Uh, Raj, David, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening to all our attendees uh, based on wherever you are joining. Uh, you are able to see the deck. Uh, so to give you a brief introduction about this webinar, this is uh, part of a, a series of webinars that um, Kandini is doing, part of our uh, knowledge series webinars on uh, digital transformation. So we had uh, four such webinars before, like a couple of them on service now, and uh, uh, one on healthcare, and, and there's one other webinar that we did on uh, uh, data science. Uh, if you look at these webinars, like one commonality that we found across all these webinars is all these webinars that we had at some point had some uh, references to cloud. So then that when we thought like let's do one webinar which is very specific to cloud, and so that like uh, uh, people who are uh, businesses who uh, uh, who still uh, who are uh, planning to move to cloud or who are already on cloud and want to excel their cloud footprint can get benefited. So this this uh, particular webinar is we are going to talk about cloud. So we all know that like cloud has been a buzzword for a while now, and uh, especially after COVID, uh, uh, cloud has become um, anybody who were even hesitating before things that like, even think about cloud now. Uh, want to have their uh, operations on cloud. Uh, especially after COVID, uh, we see a spike on the investments uh, from businesses towards their uh, towards their spending on cloud. So uh, if you look at uh, this deck, like, uh, we also see that uh, we also can understand the spike in terms of the uh, cloud spending uh, uh, as reported by Gartner. It's like 14.2% uh, uh, of the global IT uh, spending is, uh, in 2024 is to be on cloud. Um, so, so to uh, introduce uh, the panelists here, Raja uh, Rajan Narayanan is uh, from Microsoft. He has been an enterprise architect uh, working from Microsoft Redmond office. And uh, so, I and Raja have a long-standing uh, relationship where we used to work on uh, certain telecommunication projects together, where we used to handle huge databases on Oracle. And uh, there are times when, like, we used to run processes uh, on. Uh, and Solaris servers, which would run for like 32 hours, and something goes wrong in between, you have to restart everything. Okay, we really regret at that time, uh, but but like with cloud, where we had the uh, kind of uh, sophistication on cloud uh, technologies at that time, we would not have went through those pain points. And and uh, Raja is a core techie guy, and uh, he has been uh, hands-on uh, coder like for uh, 24 years now. And he is also part of uh, the Microsoft's R&D initiatives on the cloud side. Uh, someone more apt than Raja to uh, discuss on this uh, particular topic. That takes me to the next uh, panelist here, David. So David uh, is also a veteran coder. Like I remember that right, David has been coding since his uh, 11 years, and uh, David is he has been coding for more than 35 years now. So I'm just indirectly telling our old, I hope David you won't mind. And, and David is the Chief Technology Officer for uh, Anini. And uh, so he, both Raja and David have seen this whole transformation of how computing uh, has transformed those uh, olden day uh, uh, legacy machines to like uh, where we are right at the cutting edge technologies that we currently have on cloud. So they have been, they have walked through that entire uh, path. So that's about the panelists here. Uh, welcome, David. Welcome, uh, Raja. Hello, Srini. Hello, everyone. So uh, when we talk about cloud, I, I hear a lot of people say that they're already on. A lot of times, like I see that they don't understand the real capabilities of cloud. Uh, a lot of times people think that like they have uh, one or two of their servers on cloud and uh, run their applications from a cloud uh, hosted machine. They think they're already on cloud, but that's not, I mean, that's still cloud, but that's not the uh, complete uh, power of cloud. Right? We all know that like, cloud is much more than having uh, your servers, but in general, like cloud has evolved much more than like what it used uh, Initially, when uh, when it all started with cloud, like we were only talking about the infrastructure. So in olden days, like uh, uh, we were told that like, you don't have to uh, have the servers on uh, your office and get rid of uh, power backups and uh, uh, maintaining those servers and all right but, but that's not true cloud so we want to focus on in this uh, particular webinar we also want to focus on what actually cloud is so we have the right panelists to discuss on that topic right now uh, and um, let me start with raja raja you being uh, uh, on the microsoft side who is the major uh, cloud provider so what do you think uh, has been microsoft's journey uh, in this area right Right. Good question, Sani. Um, so within Microsoft, uh, Microsoft has a big IT team that runs Microsoft. You know, Microsoft 
if you think of Microsoft, Microsoft has a cluster of small companies. Right? You can think in that way. So every division has to move to cloud. That, that migration journey started from 2014, 15 time onwards. We, Microsoft itself, moved our applications to cloud, right? And we have wonderful experiences we want to share. Uh, before that, uh, based on my interactions with the industry people, right, with, with the field, uh, there are confusions. I moved my application from my on from my on premises to uh, cloud. I moved to uh, virtual machine, so I moved to cloud. Is it fine? Is it is it done? Uh, that that kind of question prevails. Uh, I I like to talk about that first. You know, See, when you move your applications from your data center to cloud, pretty much you are moving your applications from one data center to another data center, right? Uh, see, from the migration perspective, right, people should realize this thing. Let me give an analogy. Uh, people talk about pet cattle herd model, you know? Uh, let me give an analogy and then relate so that you can uh, catch up really well. Pet model, pet is the one that you keep in your home. You may have one or two pets and then you uh, feed the pet and the pet if, if the pet gets sick you bring in veterinary and then you know veterinary and then get the pet all right in return the pet gives affection to you love to you right and then the cattle comes the pet model is more like a machine running in your premises so if a machine goes bad you have to replace if ram is not sufficient you have to increase if you know, so you have to take care of that. Pet is equivalent to you running an application within your own virtual machine, with your own hardware or virtual machine in your data center or in your premises. Cattle, on the other hand, see, we don't keep cattle in our home. We keep cattle in shed, right? In shed, outside of home, in shed. And we keep cattle in hundreds or thousands. If a cattle gets sick, uh, you know, it is better to terminate this cattle, a specific cattle, terminate. Instead of bringing the veterinary in and then, you know, reviving the cattle, it is better to uh, get it killed so that the sickness won't spread to other cattle. And because this, the, the velocity of the breeding, you will manage that. That is cattle model. The cattle model it means you are hiring, you are renting a virtual machine from Azure. You are, you are renting a virtual machine from some cloud provider, right? So whenever virtual machine is uh, gone, you will simply recycle it. You'll get another virtual machine, right? It's like that. You get that, you definitely get that benefit. But it doesn't end there. Let me give one more step here. Herd model. See, anciently uh, in North America, there is a nomadic tribe that followed a herd of buffaloes. They're gypsies. They simply followed the buffaloes. Wherever the buffalo goes, uh, buffalo herd goes, they also followed. They all, they all move. In this model, right, they get milk, they get meat, they get hide anything and everything, but they don't maintain the herd at all, right? That's the model where uh, when you move to pass our platform as a service, our function as a service, you get that kind of benefit there. So going to cloud is a first step. You move to virtual machine, fine. You come to cloud, you have some benefits. Like you talk about this, right? Capital expenditure and operational expenditure, CapEx, OpEx. These terms, everyone might have heard about it, right? When you come to cloud, with the first step, you reduce CapEx, but you still have more OpEx, operational expenses. When you move towards the herd model, you can reduce operational expenses. And also you can speed up Many thanks, right? Let me pause here for any questions, Srini. Yeah, that was an interesting um, analogy. It is easy to move your applications to a cattle model. From, on, from pet to cattle, you can easily move. From your on-premise to a virtual machine, you can easily install. But that is not where you get more benefits, right? You should move towards, um, you should move towards pass and then fast, function as a service, platform as a service and function as a service. 
so let me quickly uh, put this thing right we have a iaas the far more left infrastructure as a service and then comes platform as a service and then comes function as a service actually between platform as a service and infrastructure as a service there is container as a service comes right i think we'll be talking about the cloud native development as well there are a lot of uh, container based talks coming up so if you see iaas container as a service platform as a service function as a service as you move towards right you reduce your operational impact and then you get more value for the money so you should move but it is not about simply moving your application from virtual machine to pass you need to redesign you need to rearchitect right typically typically i'm not saying always typically when people develop applications in the past we followed kind of centralized architecture right one big monolith anything and everything is with the application if you ask for any module authentication is there authorization is there uh, this functionality is there that functionality is there peripheral services are there everything is built within the application itself right one central application you cannot if with that model you cannot scale a specific feature specifically for example i want uh, my shopping cart to um, withstand more load i want to increase scale for shopping cart alone you cannot do that with a centralized model so we need to distribute right you need to distribute you need to go typically go for microservices like architecture right i understand this is not a architecture uh, discussion panel i just want to hint there you need to go towards distributed computing model when you go to distributed computing model then comes the benefit of cloud right if you see in cloud uh if if you see in cloud th things are kind of scattered right um you you have authentication service separately azure ad you have a key vault you have a telemetry service you have a database as a service you have a applicate is right Inf internet information service like web server like a service you have everything is like a service is there available right so it'll be deploy you'll be using them you'll be connecting them accordingly whenever you need it right so now it comes a distributed computing but beware distributed computing is not the one gold bullet you know it comes with its own problem distributed computing is not easy uh when things are not easy when when our developers when our dev team is not ready it's not ready because our dev teams are used to develop centralized applications right we build and then we'll give the uh, application to some build team and they will build it and then they'll configure and then release it to a deployment with with the distributed computing model the cloud offers other benefits as well you know uh you, you can you know you, it kind of aligns well with your agile model number one devops comes into picture everything as code i think we should talk about everything as code as well this is important and then because your services are small and tiny you can take any changes to production faster if you are envisioning a new change if you are envisioning a new change or if you are envisioning a new feature if you want to bring it in distributed model you can take it to production super fast and cloud support distributed models you know uh and then when you plan to move to cloud from big monolith to microservices model you should move towards right and you may wonder hey i know all these things but how am i going to move give me some guidance if you ask me from the perspective there are various frameworks available if you go to azure.com and look for af cloud adoption framework there's something called cloud adoption framework it guides you how to assess how to plan how, what and all you should do you know lot of things it's not that you one day you are going to move all your application from virtual machines to pass it's not going to work right you need to tangle you need to pull the string by string and then you need to make it up all, all see you have to do all these things while your application is running you have to define your architecture accordingly <clears throat> any questions so far yeah that was a wonderful uh, explanation uh, rajayaman 
someone who doesn't understand like uh, uh, what cloud is could be able to take away some uh, lessons from uh, from this discussion so david so you have walked this journey uh, david uh, throughout your career so do you want to add to uh, any of raj's uh, uh, discussion sorry uh, my comments kind of uh, lead into uh, the following questions so we can uh, reserve that for uh, question number 3 uh, for where i was going to comment on right uh, see when you move to cloud uh, take out the functionality separately and then try to move them to a you know for move forward towards the uh, towards the lower apex model right from virtual machines you may want to move to pass let let's talk what now you should do right uh, when you move to cloud uh, from virtual machines to pass think of taking the identity model out you know azure ad they have azure active directory that support wonderful federated model you know with a click of button you can configure multi factor authentications what type of authentication you want username password and certificate based authentication or username password and phone authentication phone factor kind of authentication or what are the authentication you want it it provides suite of services right and also uh with, with the pass uh you get the services are readily available to you right for example your application uh, or the development team may want to use uh no sql db right no sql databases like azure document db cosmos db or mongo db something like that see if it is virtual machine right if a team is going to spend at least a sprint to install and monitor to install and configure mongo db right mongo db or docu- document db is not available as a Android thing, but if you want to install document uh, uh, no SQL DB, it's going to take time for your team to configure, configure in the best possible way, right? Uh, now with with the pass, it's like with the click of a button you can include within your subscription, and also you are not paying upfront, right? You are not paying upfront license cost. You are going to pay for the usage, right? So th- these are the advantages of pass, and then you need to architect accordingly, right? plan of think of distributed computing api based interactions all these things the team should think okay yeah, thanks thanks raja those are a lot of uh, those could be a lot of insights for uh, for anybody who is uh, planning uh, their cloud migration so the next topic uh, that uh, we have to touch upon uh, i mean we, i mean we cannot uh, end a discussion about cloud without, without touching this uh, particular topic right so what are the best practices uh, maybe this is a question for david uh, david what are the best practices that um, you think right say as raja said like it's a complete journey it's not uh, a, a one day uh, activity that you are going to do right uh, it could be a complete journey by itself like uh, moving to cloud uh, there are a lot of companies there are there could be different strategies like uh, uh, even before you move to a cloud you have to have a proper uh, cloud strategy defined okay so that is the key activity that you need to perform even before you uh, uh, start your cloud journey right So what are the considerations that you need to give when you plan your cloud? Well, the first thing you need to take a look at is you really need to know your the state and architecture of your current application. What are all of the uh, pieces involved? How what frameworks does it use? Um, how does it communicate between any of the services that maybe maybe running within that application? What are your external dependencies? Um, are you relying on Uh, any connections to uh, to the internet to any uh, external data um, so you have to really understand your current application um, if you've inherited an application your first step really is to dig in deep and understand how it's architected without that you can't do an effective migration to the cloud um, once you understand your architecture then you can do it in a couple of different ways um you can try to move the entire application uh, as was mentioned before um in one shot which is very risky um a lot a lot can go uh can go astray during a a type of uh move everything type of strategy um depending on the complexity of the application it's often easier to do it in pieces for instance if you know um in a typical web application you would have a web server perhaps your data model uh, your data services and your database um a good first step is to uh 
somewhat of a hybrid model where you might leave your application on-prem, but then you use Azure SQL. You start migrating your data and your strategies there. Um, and then once you're comfortable with uh, the data organization and, and performance, then you can move your web application. Um, you know, that, that's, that's one approach. Um, but, uh, and, and then when you have uh, external services, external data needs, you need to take into account uh, security. You know, how, how do you prevent, um, or how will you architect it to make sure the data that's coming in is what you're expecting? Make sure it's not being um, intercepted or you know, make, make sure, it, do, do, do general data quality checks and validations. Don't just blindly accept data coming into your application, assuming that it's coming from the intended user. Uh, especially in, in these recent times, security is a primary focus when moving to cloud. Yeah, G go ahead, Roger. Yeah, yeah, wonderful point. Uh, uh, pretty much uh, David covered everything. Uh, actually, uh, when you, the best practices of uh, developing application for cloud are moving towards, uh, is another one is design for failure. Expect failure always, right? Don't expect the system is sturdy. Yes, system is going to be sturdy, but see, this is distributed computing, right? Services are connected over wire. Anything can happen. Anything can happen. Uh, so design for failure means uh, ex fa expect failure always and accordingly design. Do a retry at the client side, right? When you do a retry, you should not do multiple time post. For example, you are posting some data to a web service posting some data, not getting, posting the data to web service. And before the web service response, internet you know, disruption happens, right? So the client didn't know whether the server processed or not. The client will retry. Server should not reinsert itself, you know, reinsert the data again. Item potency, there, there are a lot of best practices available. We can share it with our uh, ebook that Kanini is going to share. We can share those best practices, that is one. And security, definitely security. You guys are all heard about the solar wind issue, right? Recently, the recent solar wind attack. So don't expect things are, uh, you know, secure by default. It is as a developer, it is our responsibility to secure the system. As an architect, it is our responsibility to design the system securely, right? Um, security. See, with a monolith application, with a centralized application, everything is kind of within it, within itself. So you may not give much significance uh, to a uh, monolith, but with this distributed services, every entity, every distributed entity should take care of security very seriously, right? Um, we talked about security. We talked about um, the thing, right? Um, the best practices and the design patterns varies. So development team cannot simply live on the old design models that we used to use in the past. They have to move to a modern patterns, modern distributed patterns models, right? And don't try to build anything and everything by yourself. If you let developers, the passionate developer, they will build database by their own. We all know that, right? But here, try to reuse the existing services. Don't try to build by yourself. Uh, there are services available in a subscription basis in a very low cost model, right? When we talk about a uh, model, I think we can talk about the uh, pricing model a little later. Uh, on this context, uh, security is definitely must be considered and try to reuse as much as possible. And then design for failure, that is the important thing. Design for failure. Right, right. You're, uh, you're uh, totally right on that, uh, Raja. And also a lot of times, like uh, when, we, uh, when, when, when we ask someone, like especially from a business standpoint, like if, when we ask them like cloud is more secure, and then they kind of think that, how do you think it's going to be secure? Right now I have my servers on my premise. I have someone uh, monitoring my servers like 24 by seven. And now you say that my servers are going to be moved to a, a remote location, which uh, I don't even know where it is going to sit. And now you call that as more secure, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, there is a logic in their question. Okay? They don't know right. where the server is located. Okay, All they see is an instance of it, right? Uh, yeah, so, so yeah, of course, like uh, businesses, uh, when, when you want to convince someone from a business side, like you have to go through all the tokens and uh, make sure that like, they are convinced. 
I, right, I totally right. agree to that. Okay. Uh, to that point, David, uh, you might have come across a lot of use cases uh, in which like you have leveraged cloud and, and you might have thought that like, hey, without cloud, I may not have solved this problem. Can you can you talk about any of those use cases uh, uh, that you have uh, or a problem that you have solved using cloud, uh, David? Yeah, there's uh, one in particular that comes to mind. Um, so typically with on-prem uh, data centers, you have a certain amount of hardware. You know, you might have, uh, you know, a 24 core machine and, you know, it's, it's everything's running fine. But then you come up on a problem which just can't be solved with a single, uh, you know, even, even a, a, a relatively small or medium sized data center. One such problem was um, in, the, in the area of uh, data analytics, specifically uh, combinatorial problems. So combinatorial problems, think if you have uh, 20 playing cards uh, laid out in front of you and you want to pick, uh, just pick any random five and, uh, but they can be in any order, but you want to find, I want to, I want you to tell me what are all the possible five hands uh, that, that are possible out of that 20, uh, out of those 20 cards. It seems like a, a relatively simple problem, but it's, it's exponential growth. So we, if you pick three cards out of 20, you know, it, it's, it's a, you know, six or so, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's a relatively small number of combinations that are possible. But as, as that grows uh, towards the midpoint, it, it explodes. So one of, one of our problems uh, that someone came to us with was they had 100 items and they wanted to pick 20. They want to show all combinations of any 20 of those 100. Doing some initial analysis, um, it was going to take something like um, uh, five times 10 to the 20th operations. That's how many combinations there were. It's, it's a very, very large number. And the fastest algorithm I could find could do 1 billion of these per second. To put that in perspective, the total number There's of combinations that were possible, possible. Uh, at 1 billion per second was still gonna take 548 billion seconds, which is, uh, I believe was something like 30,000 years um, for one CPU to do it. Mm -hmm. So the only way to accomplish this in a reasonable amount of time, say like a week, would be to use Azure, uh, something, something like a Azure Cloud, where you can, uh, something like with uh, Databricks or some other kind of distributed computing, you can spin up a massive number of these virtual machines to do this kind of processing within the time frame you desire. Um, so I think to solve this problem in a week, we could accomplish it with about 16 to 20,000 virtual machines, which you're not gonna be able to do that in your standard on-prem data center. Even, even a large company data center outside of Microsoft and, and others is, is not going to be possible. Right. 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 Yeah. yeah, that right. is the scale of right. um, 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 uh, cloud can, um, can grow. Right, right. Actually, let me add, uh, chime in here quickly on that point uh, to just add more to what David said. Uh, the corporate a network team, you know, the data center team may say, hey, my data center is also kind of elastic. Yeah. Okay, data centers are elastic, but how soon, how fast it can be elastic, you know, how fast it can expand and shrink, that matters. Uh, when application need more juice, more power, it need power in next microsecond or next milliseconds, the seconds time frame, not after two days, right? So that, that part need to be thought. Uh, you know, you can configure load configurations um, in Azure with a click of a button. You know, when the load increases, it's automatically going to increase the scale, it's automatically going to shrink. We need that feature. Right, right. Yes, right. Sorry, that's not completely uh, um, on target on that. So we have a poll open right now. Uh, I would request all of the uh, uh, attendees to. Um, uh, to uh, take uh, a few uh, take a few seconds to uh, answer the uh, question, answer the uh, uh, poll. Okay, so while, while while we answer that poll, let's move on to the uh, uh, next topic. Okay, 
So we also talk about like uh, when when Raja was mentioning about like uh, actually uh, leveraging the power of cloud. Uh, we were also talking about refactoring and app modernization, right? So, so how much is uh, how much uh, refactoring and app modernization would impact uh, business, Raja? So how do we kind of leverage the actual uh, power of cloud to uh, refactoring and uh, app modernization? Right, right. The uh, app modernization is a very big umbrella, Srini. In my opinion, it's very big umbrella. Uh, teams have to modernize. They should move from the centralized application model to the distributed application model, and then they should leverage existing services within Azure instead of building everything by themselves. And see, uh, when we talk about the refactor and uh, replatforming, right? We should also talk about DevOps. We should also touch about that. That is that is important to touch, right? Uh, five years ago, five to six years ago, uh, here when my team started moving to cloud, we had a separate release management team. We had a separate build management team. We had a separate configuration management team. We had service engineers, right? We have development team. We had this many, you know, teams to run an application. If you give a feature for them to implement, it reaches production in six months, right? It used to be like that. So from the leadership, we got a wonderful support to merge everything into DevOps team. So one DevOps team, you know, that team is responsible for anything and everything from story grooming to deployment and maintaining application, right? So here, when we give it to the DevOps team, uh, they try to code everything, right? So you might've heard about infrastructure as a code, IAAC, infrastructure as code, hey, don't go to cloud and then uh, drag and drop and then configure saying, I, I need this machine, I need this service. Don't do that. Don't do through UI. Code everything. Infrastructure is a code. Likewise, your build need to be coded. Your build, uh, not the build, build is a simple line, right? Build pipeline need to be coded, right? Release pipeline, keep it as a code. Everything is a code. So things are repeatable. Things are auditable, right? And with, with the replatform, right? With, with the distributed computing model, uh, uh, let me take back. With a centralized development model, database mean people think of SQL Server or Oracle, right? You don't have to, you don't have to. A simple blob storage can be your database, right? So don't think of only SQL Server as your database. There are various options available. So based on your requirement, think through and then replatform accordingly, right? So cloud support, something called polyglottism. You know, uh, polyglottism is a term that every techie people know. It means it is not only one technology in cloud, you know? I can run a function, Azure function in PowerShell, another function in PHP. I can have uh, one SQL DB, one MongoDB, one document DB, right? And then I may have Azure Synapse for database. I can have Azure Data, uh, Databricks for database. So think of that, you have, a, you have a lot of options in front of you. So you have to pick and choose for the platform that you are working on. Now there are options are, you no, know, lot of options you have in front of you, leverage them, right? And then when we talk about refactor area, uh, seed exos will have this question. Yeah, I have a big application sitting here. How am I going to move? One advantage is, uh, sorry, one recommendation I would provide is pick a critical feature. You know, while a, a team is kind of, uh, while a specific team is kind of refactoring an application, uh, pick a new feature and implement within the uh, Azure functions or Azure app service, you know, move in that way. And then slowly refactor it accordingly. accordingly. All the modules should I mean, you know, all the modules should go as a separate services and then define interactiv interactivity between them. Accordingly, you should move. I'll pass for yeah, questions. Right. Well, I, I think what you said is is critical, especially um, when migrating from on-prem to cloud is embrace the service-oriented architecture. Um, the primary advantage of that is um, if te technology changes rapidly, so, you know, it, today, if you define um, a particular service using uh, a particular technology, 
but a new one comes out, if you've stuck to the service-oriented architecture and have defined the contracts between your services, right. you should be able to switch out the background technologies without any impact to your application. Right. So you can take advantage of newer um, newer offerings from from Microsoft or newer um, you know additional modules in your own application by taking advantage of the service-oriented architecture and defining your contracts so that everything is pluggable right. and scalable. Right. So, and the right. innovations are uh, very av available in cloud very fastly, you know, than before. Uh, if we talk about data warehousing, right? Uh, data warehouse was a concept. Now lake house concept is coming up and then data mesh concept is coming up. The, to support this concept, tools are available today. You have to just go and explore and use it. Right? See, uh, back in days, uh, database is always connected to the compute. Database means you'll have a data file and a compute and a you know, database engine always clubbed together. Now the model is reference-based model. You have a data file somewhere. You can take your compute to wherever the data is. You know, like ADB, if you see Azure Databrick, the model, and Azure Synapse, the model is like, take your compute to the data. You don't have to move the data. Data need not to come to the compute. The compute can refer data from disparate locations, perform necessary compute, and then produce output. See, this is a new concept. This is available in the cloud. The tools are available in the cloud. So use it. Yeah, those are those are great insights on the uh, uh, the latest uh, technologies and trends available, Raja. But but mm -hmm. a lot of times, like when when uh, uh, when it comes to applications, right? One challenge that uh, most businesses go through is performance. Okay, whether it uh, be a e-commerce site or like uh, a customer support team or whatever, right? So there will always be like peak load scenarios where where uh, performance needs to be optimized, and then we also have to uh, bring a balance between. Uh, yeah, we can always uh, mitigate the challenges with performance uh, by by increasing the resources that may not be a good strategy, especially when it comes from a, a ROI perspective or from a cost perspective. You always have to optimize your resources and performance, right? So right. so what do you think are the best practices or best um, ways to uh, tackle this issue um, when it comes to performance? Wonderful. Sure. Good question. See, you're right. Uh, typically, when application wants, more, when we want more performance from applications, right, we typically throw hardware towards it. Add more RAM, add more, you know, add more uh, uh, processor. You know, that's how that's what that's what we used to do because that is relatively cheaper. But in the cloud model, you should consider it cautiously. Cloud offers two kind of model, right? Uh, one is a fixed price. For example, you are planning and then um, reserving a capacity. For example, my app service, I want S3. For my app service, I want premium S2. No, like that you you reserve it and then you pay for it, right? Another one is a serverless model where based on the processing power, based on the processing utilization, based on the memory utilization, you'll be charged. So obviously you need to tune your application. So tuning the application in cloud is better. Also, it is possible to easily throw hardware towards the application. That's possible, but you are going to pay more, right? So now, Performance, when we talk about, right? Performance means there are three things. Three things comes under performance umbrella. Availability, reliability, response time, right? Response time not alone is performance. Your application must be available right. all the time whenever I need it. And application is reliable, right? And see, to monitor availability, application insight can come into picture. You know, application insight can you can configure so that your application is pinged or poked from multiple different geographic region, regions. Hey, from this region, your application is accessible. So it, it can make available. You know, you can test the availability. And reliability, you know, reliability is most, mostly with the coding part that you have to take care. Availability part, uh, availability, reliability, we're talking performance, response time part, you can do a load testing and you can generate load See, we used to run load runner and other kind of tools, or Visual Studio load testing tools from on-prem with two or three virtual machines, right? Now, if you want to squeeze your uh, service, you can generate tons of load. 
from across the globe. You know, their services are available. And application insight can log all these things. And Azure uh, Advisor, there's a service called Azure Advisor that will tell you, hey, you are overusing this area. You are overusing this. Optimize this. Do in that way, you know. It, it provides that uh, optimization technique and then tells you, you need to scale down here, you need to scale up here. It, it recommends a lot of things. Not only on performance, it recommends many things on security as well. Right, right. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, I've seen some of those uh, uh, cost optimization alerts on uh, on on uh, my own instance of um, um, Azure. Okay, where like whenever we spin off a machine and then I go to a dashboard where it shows like, hey, um, here are the things that you can optimize, like uh, the resources that uh, you have uh, that uh, that we have dedicated for you are not being properly utilized, and you can kind of uh, uh, dump down it. Right, right. In, right. Infrastructure optimization is always monitored and then advice are given. Hey, you are overusing this. You don't need this big of hardware. Reduce it. It tells that. Yeah. Application yeah. optimization, it is up to the devs, though. And there are right. uh, tools available, you know, like FXCOP, static code analysis. And actually, App Services has, um, has a plugin. If you go to Diagnosis tab and then uh, look for a specific plugin, Optimization advisor, it tells you if this part of code is doing something expensive, change it. It tells you that. Right, right. So to that point, uh, David, like, uh, is there any any use case that you can think of uh, in your experience, like where you uh, had uh, had to optimize uh, the performance and uh, the cost? Oh well, uh, continuously. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, several projects or areas come to mind. Um, you know, have been working on a, a very large application which involves um, Databricks, SQL Server, Service Bus, um, many Azure functions, as well as uh, web applications. And diagnosing the performance between those would be difficult if it weren't for some of the centralized monitoring tools, um, such as App Insights and others. Um, you know, because it's a it's a one stop shop where it can correlate all the different events from all your different services to help you pinpoint where the issue is. Um, one in particular uh, recently is, is there, there's an application which was making, um, it's basically an FTP connection or an API connection to an external data provider. And half of the data wasn't showing up as expected. And in order to track that down, we used the logging available within App Insights, as well as some of the uh, diagnostics. And we found it was because um, the developer uh, was recreating a connection, an API connection, rather than reusing an existing open connection. So it was exhausting the network bandwidth uh, for the app service, too many connections. Uh, normally, it would have been very difficult to find that. You would have had to put a logging statement after you know every every line of code uh, in a in a service to find that, but by having a centralized uh, holistic view of your application, um, it was much easier to find. Right, wonderful point. Right. I just want to add one more uh, quick point here, uh, Sini. Right. See, uh, before one of the applications we had, it is very critical to Microsoft. Um, suppliers from all over the world connect to that application, log in and then provide the details and all, right? This application was an on-premise. And then whenever something is not working, the supplier have to uh, create a support ticket. They have to call and the support ticket takes its own life cycle to reach the development team to get it fixed. You know, if you see from the time of the report to the deployment fix of uh, time of um, deploying the fix, it takes really two to three weeks. It used to back in days, right? Now, with application insight integrated, right? Application insight is a service where your application telemetry is logged. So our service engineer or DRI, the DevOps engineer, knows, hey, this user encountered an error. They get an alert, a specific user encountered an alert. So even before user come to us, we reach users. See how happy the users here, users are here, right? So that is important. And uh, I would say uh, this is one experience I loved when I moved to this thing, right? And also, logging mean typically what we think of. We need to log. We need to 
log a telemetry. Okay, let me log everything into SQL Server database. Developers, we all think in that way, right? Okay, log into database. But <laughs> application insight is uses different kind of telemetry, right? Because data is immutable. Events are kind of logged consistently one after another, right? You should see the speed. On terabytes of data, you can query, the response comes in a few milliseconds. That, that configuring, uh, keeping that on-premise or virtual machine is too difficult. Right, right. Not, yeah. not to mention having to maintain that SQL server and do backups and performance optimizations. You know, it's a whole other system you have to maintain just for your login. Right. right. I think it's time for another poll that do take some uh, few seconds to answer that next poll question. Uh, well, that poll question is being answered. Let me do a quick, quick time check. So we have seven minutes left. Now, like when it comes to business uh, uh, vertical, how can uh, uh, different, uh, different business verticals leverage the power of cloud? I mean, I know that cloud is kind of a uh, uh, mature that a lot of businesses have already are already like leveraging the, uh, the har harnessing the power of cloud. Okay. So what are the industries that you think, uh, David and Raja, that uh, could uh, better benefit from cloud? I mean, I know like all the businesses benefit from cloud, but, but which are the industries that you could, uh, that could be a game changer, uh, uh, cloud could be a game changer. Okay, uh, I'll go first, uh, Dave. Um, see, finance, I'm working for Microsoft Finance, right? So the finance industry definitely uh, take, data is secure. Your data, finance mean immediately the data things comes in here. Your data is secure in cloud. I was talking to one of my friends the other day, uh, finance industry, hey, my finance data, should I keep it with me or should I keep it in cloud? That question comes, right? What about security? So I told him, hey, uh, where do you keep your money? Do you keep your money in all the money in your home or do you keep all your money in the bank? Right? So Azure is like bank here. So they will keep your data secure. And definitely finance industry and uh, medical technologies, you know, with IoT, with IoT explosion, right? Uh, the, the edge services support medical uh, services. Also the cognitive services, you know, they can analyze, they can provide anom anomaly kind of related topics to medical related service. And mostly now the car automation, car automation, right? Like Tesla, the auto driving cars, self-driving cars. Nowadays cars are collecting a lot of telemetry, terabytes of data, terabytes of data that they collect. They cannot keep everything in the car. You know, they need to, move to cloud and then process it and bring it back. I mean, just uh, one of the most common uses that uh, every that's available in everyday life now is routing services. You know, I wanna go from my house to, uh, to this uh, location, this business that I've never been to, how do I get there? What's the fastest route? The, uh, you know, these uh, mapping applications, they couldn't route you to that destination and take into account traffic or construction or anything else without the cloud. It would, it would just be too much data to, to handle in any kind of on-prem solution. Right. Overall, every application is moving to cloud. Every industry is moving to cloud, Srini. Every industry. Uh, one of the engagement was with uh, Pizza Hut. Hey, they have a big data set. They have a big offering. From, we have a big offering to Pizza Hut from cloud. You know, So every industry is moving. Right, right. So I think that brings us to the last four minutes of uh, this session. And uh, we all always want our uh, participants to attendees to um, ask any questions that they may have. Uh, so we are open for any questions that you want to ask. Okay. Uh, the question is about like, how do we measure the reliability? In the cloud? Yeah, that's okay. an interesting. Right. See, uh, if you go to azurecharts.com, uh, I'll share the link. Uh, later. If you go there, uh, it tells you the availability of all the services. It also tell, see, the reliability comes into two, from, you have to measure it from two places, right? It's not only from Azure Cloud. Your code also must be reliable. What if your code kind of fails repeatedly, right? So your code cannot be reliable. The one thing is Azure offers uh, so many of percentage saying, hey, I am reliable to this much. I'm, whatever data that you provide, I'll keep it reliably within me. They provide that. They, the measurement varies. It's a big topic, I would say. The measurement varies. And industries divided, hey, you need to measure reliability in this way only. You need to measure it reliability in that way only. But I would say, what matters to you? Your, is your application reliable mean? 
uh, is it storing and retrieving data in a consistent, reliable way? Right. That, that's what you should look into. If you, st you store the data, is it gone? Right. And um, for example, you are storing the data in a database or in a data lake in West US2 region. The entire region is gone. Right. So what what will ha what will happen to my data? So we have to configure saying, okay, I need to have a region redundancy or I need to have a geographic redundancy and I need to configure it, right? They provide the redundancy. You can, even if your database is available in West US 2, you can configure replicas available in East Coast or in some other geographic, some other authoritarian region totally. You can configure it. You, know, you can increase the reliability accordingly. What we used to do in on-premise world, we used to run a DR site, right? Disaster recovery site or KU site, people say that. KU site or disaster recovery site. We never test that. Only when disaster strikes, people get to know whether the disaster strikes is working or not. But in cloud, it's not like that. Your data is replicated everywhere, and then whenever you want, you can connect and test. Right now, yeah, yeah. And I was saying, you know, even within a particular uh, region or even a data center, um, for instance, if you have a, a, a a virtual disk set up in Azure. That virtual disk doesn't exist on one single server on one single hard drive in that data center. It is spread across multiple machines, multiple racks, provide that right. failover, that redundancy, that reliability to ensure uh, that your data doesn't get lost. Um, you know, so that would be very difficult to do in a, you know, in an on-prem. You know, most on-prem data reliability, they think, Okay, well, let's just do a RAID RAID six or RAID ten. Uh, that that's built into any most of your storage in Azure, except it's you know not one disk, five disks. It's hundreds of locations. Right. right. Uh, if you want to give a use case, um, we have petabytes of data uh, replicated, you know, reliably across US. With a low latency network, you know, right. being available to us. So, any other questions? Yeah, I hope uh, there are no other questions. Yeah, if you have other questions, uh, do feel free to reach out to us and uh, we should be able to answer uh, any of the questions that you have. Uh, you can reach out to us at uh, uh, transformations.com with any of your questions or any of the uh, if you need any assistance with your uh, tri cloud transformation journey, you can always reach out to us. And, um, and yeah, I think we are uh, coming to the close of the session. Uh, thanks, Raja. Thanks, David, for uh, uh, all your insights that you provided and uh, uh, taking uh, uh, time uh, between your busy schedule to participate in this webinar. I, I learned a lot of, uh, from this discussion. Uh, we will have a recording of this webinar as we will be sharing in an email. And uh, we will also follow an ebook on, on this topic. Thank you. Thank you all for your participation. Thanks, Raja. Thanks, David. Sure, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.